I'm going to talk about alcohol, but I thought you can't really talk about alcohol without talking about glucose regulation and how you store glycogen and how you make glucose in your body and what a wrench alcohol can throw into that whole system. So I wanted to cover kind of the background physiology as well. So this one should be forwarding you now, right? And it's not working. Okay, so which one? The big one. Okay. All right. So um, glucose metabolism. So when you start eating, carbohydrate moves through the digestive tract, and all carbohydrates turn into glucose and end up in the bloodstream. And then once in the bloodstream, it's insulin, as you know, that transports um, glucose into the muscles, into the cells, and helps store glucose in the liver. So we're going to dim the lights a little bit so there's not a glare. So this just shows the little blue dots, glucose moving into the muscle. And you actually do store it in the muscle, and you do store it in the liver. And once it's there, we call it glycogen. So when you store it, you're, you're storing pretty large amounts. It depends on your body size, of course. But when you check your blood sugar with your meter, you're only seeing how much sugar is actually in your blood. You can't find out, are you 50% full in your muscles? Are you 30% empty out of your liver? There's no way of actually testing the amount you have stored. And it's not really easy to predict what that is. So when glycogen stores are low in your muscles and in your liver, your body is able to make some glucose new, and we're going to talk about that. But when glycogen stores are low, they want to be full. So your muscles are going to be pulling sugar in until they're full. And your liver is going to try to replenish until it's full. And I think sometimes that leads to low blood sugars that come unexpectedly hours into the night, maybe after exercise. <clears throat> and so you need to eat enough carbohydrate to actually have the energy you need for growth, for play, for activity, for thinking, for working, but also to store adequate amounts of glycogen in the muscles and liver. And I think sometimes people don't get enough carbs. I think it's easy to eat low carbs and see lower blood sugar and so it's easy to say, oh, you're running kind of high, let's skip the milk or let's skip the fruit. And I think that backfires in the end if you don't have enough glycogen stored. So exercise is another big component of how much glycogen gets used up. And we're going to talk about exercise after the alcohol. So one mechanism we have for pro providing glucose is actually making new glucose right in the body. And it's called gluconeogenesis, and it simply stands for glucose new making. So gluconeogenesis is part of metabolism <coughs> for everybody. The way that works is if you don't have enough carbohydrate that you've eaten to keep your uh, blood glucose levels up, you will break down little bits of muscle as a protein. It's made out of amino acids. Those building blocks are quite different than glucose building blocks. So muscles are made out of amino acids and the body will slowly break them down shuttle those amino acid building blocks to the liver, and then the liver can dismantle them into their carbons and hydrogens and oxygens and reassemble them and turn them right into glucose. So that's why people who fast or people who are, you know, for whatever reason they can't eat. It's not like people die in three days from no food, and that's because we have a pretty substantial supply of food called our muscles, and we will continue to break those down to provide glucose because glucose is the fuel for the brain. Glucose is the fuel for the vital organs, and you'll take it at the expense of your muscles if you don't eat it. So you might as well enjoy the food and get the carbs rather than break down your muscles to supply them. So let's talk about, yes? Body fat. Body fat does not turn into glucose. Body fat can be broken down and turned into ketones, and I do have that pathway in those slides later on in the show. But you don't actually turn fat into glucose. We wish you did, for people <laughs> wanting to kind of go exercise and burn it off. You, you can burn fat in certain circumstances, but you always have to have glucose while you're burning the fat. You have to have glucose available at the same time. So we'll go into detail about that. So let's talk about when you eat. So if you eat lunch at noon, that lunch is digesting over the next few hours. And not if you just had fruit and yogurt, that's going to be pretty quick. But if you had a sandwich and you had some chips, you had an apple, you had a normal balanced meal 
or you had a full dinner. It takes about four hours to completely digest that meal and get the carbohydrate turned into glucose. And so that's about how long you can count on available glucose from your meal. But when the meal's done digesting, it's not like we just fall over. So if we eat at noon, we have sugar available for four hours, till 4 p.m., let's say. What happens between 4 p.m. and dinner is that you use some of your stored glucose. And that's usually the liver releasing back some glucose. Alcohol can totally interfere with that process. And this is where having diabetes and taking insulin, which is a necessary part of diabetes, and trying to fit alcohol into that can become a problem. So alcohol directly interferes with the liver doing gluconeogenesis, the making of new sugar. We rely on that when there's no food in our systems. We rely on our livers being able to make sugar. Alcohol impedes that process. So when you drink alcohol, where does it go? It goes directly to the liver. The liver sees it as something that has to be detoxified, broken down, and converted into something else. And alcohol is not converted into glucose. Alcohol is converted into fat. So we're gonna repeat that a couple times. But the liver can't do both things well at the same time. If it's working on breaking down alcohol, it is not working on making new glucose. Something has to give. The alcohol takes the priority. So the liver sees that as something that's sort of toxic to the system and it needs to be broken down, and that's where the energy goes. Blood sugar can drop as a result. So the slide that I put together here is kind of layer by layer animated to look at it visually. I'm a really visual person. It helps me to see things. So the yellow curve shows blood sugar, for example. The sugar in the blood rises after you eat a meal, provided you have glucose in the meal, carbohydrate. Usually after eating a meal, the blood sugar is at its highest point about one or two hours after you eat the meal. Of course, some meals digest faster, I know that, and some digest slower, but on your standard mixed meal that's a balanced diet, if you eat at noon, your blood sugar will be highest about one or two o'clock. It usually takes about four hours to completely finish digesting lunch or dinner. Some meals might digest a little bit faster and some fatty meals, sorry, let's go back where we were. Some meals can digest a little bit slower than that as well. There we go. So when a meal's done digesting and the blood sugar is falling because the food's finishing digest digestion, the insulin's moving it into the muscles, the insulin's helping to store some in the liver. By the time the food's done digesting, the only source of glucose is then coming from the liver. So after a meal, you've got your pizza or your burrito, in my case tonight, or you have your sandwich or whatever you have with carbs, that's gonna last you about four hours. But when that's done digesting, there is no more sugar coming out of the intestine. The liver is gonna say, no problem, I've got you covered. I've got a storage of glucose and I can let it out. And that's what you survive on all night long while you're asleep is the liver steady stream of glucose coming back out so that you can sleep through the night. That is why you need basal rates at night to cover the glucose that's coming out of the liver. Sorry, you know, I've got this pointer. That's not my pointer, it's your pointer. It has three buttons. This is a lot for me to have three buttons <laughs> to, have to deal with. Um, but so what's happening here, one's a pointer. The glucose is coming out of the liver until you drink that drink. And once the alcohol is in your system, the liver is going to focus its attention on breaking down the alcohol. It doesn't turn it into glucose. In fact, gin, bourbon, vodka, whiskey, and scotch have absolutely zero grams of carbohydrate. They don't turn to glucose. Wine also, less than one gram of carbohydrate per glass of Chardonnay or Cabernet. Wine is made out of juice, but it is converted to alcohol when you ferment it. There's no carbs in it. Wine doesn't raise your blood sugar. Beer has a little bit of carb. It's kind of like a beer, a bread. One bottle of beer is about the same amount of carbs as a slice of toast. 
because of the barley and the malt and the hops and so forth. Most alcohol does not have carbs unless you're mixing drinks. So once you have the alcohol in your system, it goes to the liver and the liver is going to get rid of it and turn it into fat. It doesn't turn it into glucose. And while it's doing that, which is priority, it can't let any more sugar out. So there's a pretty complex biochemical pathway, and I could cite all the pathway issues, but it's not going to meet anything unless you took six semesters of chemistry. So we don't need to go there. But I will tell you that in order to break down alcohol and in order to make new glucose, gluconeogenesis, there's one thing that's needed for both pathways. And when you're processing the alcohol, you use that one thing up, and then there's not enough left. To, to fuel the, um, the pathway of making glucose. So there you have it. You drink the alcohol. The insulin in your system is in your system, and the blood sugar can go too low. So just before I go on to the next slide, glucose from a meal lasts you four hours. When the food's done digesting, the liver's going to start releasing glucose, which is what you're surviving on. Why don't you get low if you don't have type 1 diabetes? It's because if you don't have type 1 diabetes, your pancreas is turning on and off and regulating how much insulin comes out moment by moment by moment. So your pancreas, when your blood sugar is starting to drop, will stop releasing insulin. So someone without diabetes isn't going to get a low blood sugar. Somebody with diabetes... You always fall asleep? After you always fall asleep? You might feel tired, but you're not going to have a low blood sugar. You're not going to be, you're just very relaxed. You're not going to have a low blood sugar. So the insulin in the system of somebody on a pump or who is on Lantus isn't turned off. That's in there. And that's why the blood sugar can continue to drop. So what counts as one drink is one 12-ounce bottle of beer, not the big red, red kegger cups in college. It's a 12-ounce bottle of beer. It's a four ounce glass of wine, which if they pour you that at a fancy restaurant and you're paying $10, you're gonna look at them like, that's my glass of wine. Four ounces is not big. So most people that pour a glass of wine are actually pouring two drinks. And a shot glass, those little shot glass jiggers hold one and a half ounces. That's less than a quarter cup. And it's like an eighth of a cup. Each one of those counts as one drink and they can stay in your liver for up to two hours or more. That means for two hours after drinking that drink, if your liver's cut off of releasing sugar for two hours, you can, you can actually drop quite a bit. And if you have two beers, you can be at a compromised situation for four hours. And if you have three beers in college, that is six hours that you could be setting yourself up for a low blood sugar. So obviously, the more you drink, the longer your liver is tooling away trying to clear that alcohol, and the more impaired it will be, and it will not be able to let glucose out while it's doing that, and that whole time you're at risk for lows. What if the alcohol is ingested at the time of the meal? That's where we're going with that. That's a good point. So the guidelines by the American Diabetes Association are, of course, once you're of age, that women limit to one drink and men limit to two drinks and a drink being what I just described, four ounces of wine, a bottle of beer, or a shot glass. And not to do that unless you're having a meal. And if it's not a meal time, maybe you're having a snack. But it's not gonna work to have chicken wings or beer nuts. You know, you have to have something with carbs. So if you are gonna have a drink, the time to have it is wine with your pasta meal, beer with your burrito or pizza. But that's not usually when everybody's reaching for their alcoholic beverage. So of course, don't drive at all. Don't even think about it. I just put that on. I think it's obvious, but put it on there, right? And then some people can't drink for other reasons. They have other health reasons and they shouldn't drink at all. But when do people tend to drink? Well, I work in the adult diabetes clinic and I work in the pediatric diabetes clinic and the transition clinic and the diabetes and pregnancy program and they better not drink at all. <laughs> They're pregnant. But I would say a certain group of people are drinking cocktails before dinner. They're having the martini or they're having a glass of wine while they're unwinding from work before they have dinner. That is a risk. Why? When did you last eat lunch? 
And now you're drinking on an empty stomach when you're relying on your liver to provide sugar. So with type 1 diabetes or somebody on insulin, that pre-meal cocktail is risky. When else do people drink? The younger generation, it's usually after the studies, it's usually in the dorms, it's usually at the clubs, it's at the parties that go until 2 in the morning. It is not usually, sometimes it's on the Sunday football game, okay? But a lot of people that drink are drinking late, and that is the riskiest time to drink. Because, first of all, if you ate dinner at 6, dinner's gone by 10. And if you're drinking anytime after 10, unless you have carbs in your system, you're setting yourself up for lows. And how many drinks are you having? You know, are you keeping up with all the friends? Because some people are drinking quite a bit. The more you drink, the riskier it is. What happens when you go to sleep? So if you've had three drinks and you go to bed and you're low, who knows you're low? You're, you're laying there asleep. So other things you might want to consider is that drinking alcohol often just makes you a little happy-go-lucky and you might not focus that much on your diabetes. It's just human nature that lowers inhibitions and you might not have the best judgment. So that's one point to be aware of. But if anybody at the cocktail party saw you with the martini and now sees you stumbling around, they're sort of embarrassed for you that they think you are drinking too much or getting sloppy. So a lot of people don't realize that that's a situation of low blood sugar, and certainly in the underage drinkers. My experience in the 23 years I've been at UC, 16 or 17 since we started the Peds Clinic, is I've heard every story. Underage drinking, I have never once heard of one of our kids, teens, or college students getting low and having a friend call 911. Not once. For, for a couple of reasons. One, they don't know what to do. You know, kids drink and they pass out, they put them on the couch or whatever. They throw them in the car. They don't realize that this, with a someone with diabetes, could be a serious situation. Two, you are not the kid at the party that calls and gets everyone underage that's drinking busted for making that phone call. People don't make the call. So if you're the person who has diabetes, you have to be taking care of yourself. You need to prevent these kinds of situations. You need to check your blood sugar, know your limits. You need to be really, really careful. What if you pass out? Okay, we all know what glucagon is, right? What does glucagon do? Glucagon's not sugar in a needle. It's a hormone. It's a powdered hormone that you mix with a solution. And when you inject that hormone, it beelines to your liver and says, do gluconeogenesis. What's going on? Went ahead. You went ahead? I'll, I'll pick it back while you talk. Okay, thanks. I get passionate. <laughs> okay, all right. So glucagon, holy smokes, I got really yeah. into it, didn't I? So, okay, so glucagon um, goes to the liver and it tells the liver, release your sugar. Now's the time. Well, if you've got some glycogen stored because you ate enough carbs, you didn't skip lunch, you didn't skip breakfast, you ate for your exercise so you didn't use up all your stores, you, you did everything right, so you've got a good amount stored, you'll release some if you, get, if you have glucagon in there. But what if you haven't eaten in a while and you kind of skipped a meal and maybe just had a low carb lunch? You might not have that much stored. Gluconeogenesis is what we are gonna rely on glucagon to do for you. But gluconeogenesis doesn't happen very well if there's alcohol in there. Back to the slide I just said, right? Once alcohol's in the system, you're not doing gluconeogenesis very well. So here's what doesn't work, because people try all different kinds of solutions. You know, they try to beat the system. Okay, they figure that, um, well, I'll have a rum and coke. I'll have a tequila sunrise because I'll get juice. They always tell me don't drink juice. I'm going to drink juice and that's going to protect me. Well, the thing is, is liquids get in your system and all of about as fast as you swallow it, right? So whatever carb is in the juice, whatever carb is in the Coke, the minute you get it in you, it's in your bloodstream. How long does that last? Probably not real long. How long does the alcohol last? Two hours per drink equivalent. So it doesn't usually work out to think that the carbs in the alcohol are gonna protect you. The alcohol lasts way longer than the carbs. 
Worst case scenario, I've seen people try to do everything right and say, okay, this tequila sunrise has one cup of juice, that's 30 grams of carb, and they take insulin for it. That's even worse, kind of, because now you've given yourself extra insulin to go with that alcohol, and you know, you get really low. What else doesn't work? Um, it doesn't work to say, well, I just won't take my insulin. I'll take my pump off. I'll skip my shots. Because you all know what happens when you don't take your insulin. As soon as there's no insulin in your system, you immediately start making ketones. And if you've been drinking alcohol and you have ketones and you're throwing up, you're getting rid of even more of whatever carbs might have been around. You can't not take your insulin in order to, to safely drink. So you've got limits that other people without diabetes don't have. And that's the way it is. So some people will say, well then, Every drink I have, I'll have some food. Okay, the food, that, you know, that's probably your best bet, but I still say you've gotta have some limits on how much you drink. Because if you have four drinks, that's eight hours minimum. And at some point, you're gonna to go to bed, and that's your riskiest time. And I do know two people in my career that died in their sleep from alcohol-related lows. You know, one had like four or five beers with his friends, type one, and got low while he was asleep. Smart guy, chemistry student. You would think that you would have known. So don't take the risk.